John Calvin famously described Easter as the day that our Heavenly Father pulled a fast one on the devil. Rome thought he was dead. The devil was sure that he won. The disciples watched him die. But that's not the end of the story. I want to show it to you in Mark's gospel. Would you read that text with me? Mark's gospel chapter 16, and I want to read the first eight verses. And I want to read it for you because, as I always say, the reading of God's word is more important than anything I have to say about it or anything you think about it because this is the word of the Lord. This is the sword of the Spirit. The Bible says, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back, and it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. I would be too. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. I know exactly who you're looking for, and you too know who you're looking for. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was crucified just hours earlier. He has risen. In the Greek, it's one word. It's written in the passive tense, third person. So it says, he was raised. It means God raised him up. God raised him up. He is risen means God affirmed and blessed and honored everything that Jesus said and did. He is risen. He is not here. And then I love the advice of the angel because it's the advice that God extends to every one of us. What should we do in light of this colossal announcement? Look for yourself. See the place where they laid him. Then go and tell his disciples. And I really love this. And make sure you tell Peter. Because Peter was wearing the greatest badge of dishonor of all of the disciples. Make sure that you include Peter in this news. Tell them that he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So this text is reminding us that the resurrection is a fact of history. It's ignored by much of the world today. But this text is telling us in the council of the angels, there are witnesses, there is a record, it has been verified, and you need to just go and see for yourself. That's a solid way. In fact, I would say the only way to build your faith is to examine the evidence, look for yourself, and you will be astounded at how much supporting and corroborating evidence there is for the fact that Jesus got back up out of the grave. A while back, I had a weird experience. I attended a church service in a rather ornate and classical church building, which I love to do. If I get a chance to visit cathedrals and old church buildings, I love the architecture. I especially love the stained glass windows. And this ornate church building was flanked by magnificent uh, stained glass windows. I study the symbols and wonder my, to myself, what was the author or the artist thinking? But as always, my eyes found their way to the base of the stained glass windows where you will often find the words, to the glory of God. And I felt at home. If this place is dedicated to the glory of God, I'm very much at home. But lo and behold, as the service progressed, the attending clergy never invoked the name of the God of the Bible, but he did invoke the name of the spirits of ancestors and every other imaginable ideology in the world. And I sat there thinking to myself, we're lost in unreality. They're doing everything they can to ignore the nagging reminder of the stained glass windows of an actual truth that this building was dedicated to the glory of God. We're living in an 
odd time in human history because the traditional points of authority that have been used since the dawn of human history, the existence and authority of God the Almighty and His sacred writings in the Bible, as well as the people who gather in His name, those are the sources that we used in the past. Today, it is the triad of science and research and the university. I have no problem with science and research and the university, except now they have assumed the place of telling us that faith is nothing more than your personal opinion to be used for your own therapeutic desire, when in fact they ignore the fact that the Bible is a book of history. The Bible is a book filled with times and dates and names and places. I've had the privilege on three occasions, I hope to go again next year, to Israel and Palestine and walk the dusty streets where Jesus Christ lived and ministered, visit the historic places where the disciples and the apostles walked the earth and lived their life of faith. And when you go back to Israel and, the, and Palestine, you know it hits you right in the face? This isn't myth. This isn't legend. This is history. I'm experiencing history. You can go one step further and remind you that the four documents that are called the gospel are corroborated copies throughout church history. And so they are a source of faithful witnesses. So the writers of scripture constantly advocated for a faith that isn't opposed to knowledge, but based on knowledge. I'm always slightly insulted when someone tries to tell me that my faith is a stab in the dark a grasp at a hope that can't really exist when I know that Jesus taught that faith is a deep trust in God, listen to me carefully, that is grounded in reality, not speculation. It's the way that Jesus lived. And if Jesus who lived that way and his followers could live that way, I think it works for us. Let me remind you about the five facts of history that convict every one of us as Christians and why we are followers of Jesus. The first is that Jesus of Nazareth hung on a cross. They nailed him to a tree. There are few scholars in the world that dare insult the historical fact of a man called Jesus. I'm not saying they all say he's God. Of course they don't. They'll say he's a great teacher, fine man, heroic prophet, etc., 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 etc. Of course, that's to ignore everything he said. So it's really an insult to Jesus. <laughs> uh, but Jesus himself walked the earth. The evidence is there. His empty tomb is one of the facts with all of its corresponding evidence. And there's many, there are many evidences Take the time to examine them. Do what the angel told the people to do. Look into it for yourself. Maybe you'll be like that man, Lee Strobel, who was that famous lawyer who said he sought out to disprove the validity of the Bible and the existence of Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel. And like thousands and thousands and thousands like him, when you start looking into the evidence, you end up saying what Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Thomas said, I won't believe until I see the actual prince, Jesus said, hey, Thomas, just come back and look at the evidence. And, and remember, blessed are those who believe based on the witnesses. They've not seen, but they believe the witnesses. Of course, the dis there's no denying the fact that disciples believed that Jesus appeared to them. The ladies, then the disciples, and then about 500 people. And we know from the radical difference that it made in their lives that they saw something. You can allege that it, it was nothing more than a ghost or, or, or a, a mass psychosis, or it was, in fact, Jesus who got back up out of the grave. I love to point to the fact that the number one persecutor in the first century of the church hated Christians, murdered them regularly, turned them over to the authorities, himself became the greatest champion for the gospel in his day. His name is Paul. What happened to Paul? The only thing that you can dare claim is that, as the Bible says, he met Jesus. 
and his life was turned around. Probably one of my favorites is the brother of Jesus, James, was a skeptic. Even as they hung his brother on the cross, he didn't believe. James said to his brother at one point, I think you're mad, Jesus. And even after they crucified him, James was a skeptic until he saw the resurrected body of his brother and he became the greatest leader in the church in Jerusalem. And one of the greatest writers, speakers of the gospel. But probably my first and favorite witnesses are what I call the first degree, first-hand witnesses of resurrection morning. They were three ladies. Two Marys and Salome. And they came to the tomb... These are the same ladies that the gospel records met Jesus in the Galilee, fell in love with him as their Savior, Lord, teacher, and they spent their days ministering to Jesus. The gospel writer says they spent their days following Jesus and ministering to Jesus. So when Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem, they said, we're going with you. The ladies followed Jesus to Jerusalem. They knew him as well as anybody could ever know Jesus. They watched them hang him on a tree. The Bible says the ladies watched from a distance. Their hearts were crushed. They saw the blood drain from his body. They knew his face. They knew who he was. And then they went to the tomb knowing where they had laid his body to rest. What's interesting is that if you and I were writing that story, we would not include the women as the first and greatest witnesses in the gospel story because women were not acceptable as witnesses in the first century. So either the apostles were out of their mind fabricating the most unbelievable story that could ever exist, or they simply said, the facts are, and we want you to have the facts, the first people to the tomb were ladies, were women, and they became the leading witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not the only ones, but the leading witnesses. My good buddy, Tim Keller, who's famous Presbyterian pastor in New York City and now an author, said, if Jesus rose from the dead, dead then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything that he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching. He doesn't really care about that. The issue is, do you really believe he came back from the dead? It's the cornerstone of Christianity. It defines who we are. There's a second thing I want to tell you about the resurrection. It is a nagging historical reminder that God changed the course of the world. And secondly, he changed the course of our lives. The resurrection is the single greatest power of God to change the narrative or storyline or the living of your life, which is exactly what happened in Mark's gospel. The disciples were defeated. They were hiding in fear. They were discouraged. The man that they had loved and thought he was the son of God died on the cross. <laughs> Their hearts were broken. They had no hope for the future. They wondered about their own safety and security. But after the resurrection, the whole narrative of their lives changed. Why? Because they're the ones who ex were first to experience. You listening to me, church family? The very power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was moved from that empty tomb into the heart of every believer in Jesus Christ. Jesus was risen from the dead, and you have risen with him. There is no burden. There is no difficulty. There is no suffering in your life that is greater than the power of the resurrection of Jesus. There is no loss that you have suffered that can keep that power down in your life. If you will do what you need to do, you know what that is? You need to roll the stones away from the sealed parts of your life to let Jesus give you resurrection power in the deep part of your personality where you've been wounded, broken, sinful, blind, stubborn, and whatever else. 
It means that the day Jesus got up from the grave, we were raised with him. Paul put it this way. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Do you understand what that means, church family? The trajectory of your life has changed. Your past doesn't matter anymore. And your habits and hang-ups, your obsessions and addictions, your failed marriages, and your broken heart doesn't matter anymore. You have the resident power of Christ to make you into a new crea creation in Christ so that you can face any burden, any barrier, any hindrance. The Bible says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, Mac, I live. But not I, it's Christ who lives in me. So what are some of the heavy stones that need to be rolled away in your life? Fear, regret, shame, hang-ups, hurts. Your strength will never be enough. It is only as you learn to live by faith in the Lord's presence and power in your life, the real presence and power of life, Jesus in your life, that the stones will be able to roll away. Our greatest fears are dismantled. The fear of death and abandonment and shame and all other fears are cast out. At the end of the second service this morning, I talked with a dear lady who not very long ago lost her husband and a few months later her son died. And I said to her, how do you do it? How do you do it? And with tears she said, only by Jesus' strength. Only by God's power. But it's real for us. You see, we have spiritual power. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but in Christ we've been made alive. We have moral power. We can say no to the tempter, no to our sins, no to our failures. But we also have physical power. You realize, at your moment of greatest exhaustion, you can say to God, I'm weary, Lord. I think you're all weary from the last two, three years. I think you all carry a bone, deep weariness in your souls. And only God can bring us out. Only God can resurrect your fatigue so that you can say, they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their, what? What do you think that strength is? It's physical strength. It's the energy. I am, I am animated by the energy of his spirit so that I can do things I never thought I could do. I know, I'm sure some of you are looking at me thinking, what a weirdo. I can tell you my story is that you wouldn't believe how many times I've said to God, I can't do this anymore. I can't conduct this funeral. I can't face this trial. I can't referee this fight. I'm just too tired. But if you want me to do it, Lord, I'll do it. But I'm holding you to the fact that you said I have resurrection power in my bones. And he always comes through for the children of God. Forgive me for digressing just momentarily. Many of you know my story of being raised in a broken home, experiencing all kinds of abuse, <clears throat> excuse me, in my childhood. Um, and when I came to adulthood, I had so many wounds, heartaches. I didn't know which end was up at times. But I can stand here today and tell you that this man has been redeemed and is in his right mind. I know some of you don't think I am. But I'm in my right mind for one reason and one reason only. And that is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That he set his seal upon the heart of every believer. And he said, I've got you. You're safe. You're mine. One last thing and I'll finish. And it is that uh, the missional direction of your life has changed. You may describe yourself as a teacher... You're a missionary. You may describe yourself as a lawyer. You're a missionary. You may be an active plumber. You're really a missionary. 
You may think of yourself as a mere roofer, but you're not just a roofer, you are a missionary. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ makes missionaries out of every one of us. If we experience the change of the gospel in our inner being, how can we but speak the things that have happened to us through Jesus Christ? You all have a great story to tell. You all have a magnificent witness for Jesus. I get to shepherd this wonderful congregation, and I've watched so many of you overcome trial after trial after trial after trial, and I know you do it because of the presence of Jesus in your life and the joy of being a witness for him. Here's how Jesus said it in Luke. Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Church family, uh, there's no doubt that this pandemic has kind of zapped the momentum out of many of our lives, hasn't it? To say nothing of the church. I have grieved beyond measure over the loss of momentum because of the pandemic, over which we've had no control. And as I've been preparing for this morning, you know what the Lord has reminded me? The passion and impetus and momentum of the church is the resurrection. So we get back to Jesus, get back to the resurrection, and the church will come alive. You have one great story to tell, and that is, he got back up. They put him in a grave. They sealed his tomb. He busted his way out of hell. He came back from the dead, and he offers the forgiveness of sins and eternal life to all who will trust him. So my conclusion is simply this. I dare you to see it for yourself. Dig a little bit into the evidence. Read the Gospels. But read many of the scholars around this subject. See it for yourself. I would never invite somebody to receive Jesus until they see it for themselves. Salvation is not an emotional high moment. It's a moment of clarity when you see that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world who died on the cross and came back from the grave and is the soon returning King of kings and Lord of lords. Until you see that and by faith believe that, you're not ready. But today could be the day of salvation for you. Maybe you're ready. Maybe the Holy Spirit is doing for you what he did for me. I was a pagan, 17-year-old boy, happened to be sitting in church one Sunday morning, and the pastor was preaching on 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, for the love of Christ constrains us. And God said to me, you're no longer going to do what you used to do. I have a new mandate for your life. I have a new direction for your life. I have a new purpose for your life. I want you to preach my gospel. And that's how it all started 40 years ago for me. But you've got, you've got to see it for yourself. You've got to receive him by faith. And you've got to tell somebody. Till your dying breath, you need to tell somebody, my hope is in Jesus alone. Father, I pray that your spirit would help those who have never trusted Jesus to take that step of great courage to look into these things, to examine them, to read your word and to seek you as the God who created them and loved them and wants to give them eternal life. And for those of us who have trusted Christ, maybe there are some in here this morning, Lord, that are ready to pray that prayer. Then I ask that you would open their heart and bring them to yourself and then make the church the bold and dynamic witness that you planned her to be, because I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now it's our privilege for you to see our choir, albeit uh, visual, uh, virtually, but they're still here. This is our choir.